Good morning, everyone. I'm Sigal Lon from the uh, sociology department here at Tel Aviv University. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, and present uh, this uh, panel uh, speakers. Uh, first, we'll have uh, James Green. Uh, he's the Carlos Manuel Suspendes. A professor of Latin American history at Brown University, the director of Brown Brazil Initiative, and the executive secretary of the Brazilian Studies Association. His most recent publications include Exile Within Exiles, Her Herbert Daniel, Gray Brazilian Revolutionary, and the uh, Brazil Reader. History, Culture, and Politics, both with uh, Duke University Press. Um, so uh, uh, later we'll have um, uh, Adrian Krupnik. Uh, he's uh, currently pursuing doctoral studies uh, in history at Tel Aviv University. His PhD research is uh, title is Return Migration to of Argentinian Jews from Israel, 1984 uh, to 2005. His article. Uh, between returns uh, and a hard place, Argentinian uh, returnees uh, from Israel in 1996. Was awarded the 2018 Kimmeling Prize for Best Graduate Paper by the AIS. Uh, we'll start with uh, um, James Green. He will talk uh, about uh, returning Brazilian exile, rethinking politics during the process of democratization in the uh, 1980s. And then Adrian will uh, follow uh, talking about home, bittersweet home, house uh, ownership and uh, class expectations among Argentine immigrants in Israel during the 1970s. So each of you will have about 20 minutes and then we'll have opened the floor for questions. Uh, I want to thank Renan Rein for the invitation. Um, I think he took advantage of the fact that I was in the country because they don't quite work on uh, migration, but I pulled something from a recent book to talk about today. And I would like to first dedicate uh, this uh, talk to Maria Di Franco, an Afro-Brazilian city councilwoman assassinated in Rio de Janeiro on March 14th, 2018 for her political activities, and we still don't know who's responsible for her death. Uh, Luis Honegger, Mario Schneider, Paulo Janklovic, and Marina Franco, Denise Hollenberg, and many others who have studied Latin American exiles have noted how the experience of dislocation and living in a foreign land became a privileged opportunity to rethink politics in the person, to reconceptualize social change and individual life choices, and to learn from the other in order to reimagine alternative possibilities in their home countries. Most scholars have focused on the experience of exiles going through political shifts or changing their quotidian practices. Few have examined what happened to the marginal, of the marginal, namely homosexual men and women, who were part of a revolutionary movement, or part of revolutionary movements that swept through Latin America, and then either underground or in exile discovered their non-normative sexual orientation, usually suffering as a result of being marginalized from their comrades in their home countries or in exile. So today I will use the unique case of Herbert Daniel, a Brazilian revolutionary and the protagonist of a recent biography, to consider a particular way in which exile transformed his life and how upon returning to Brazil, he transformed the political discourse in that country. And so just for context, there were about uh, 5,000 political exiles of all kinds during the 21 years of Brazilian uh, dictatorship, so it's a very small number of people, actually. Herbert Daniel was an exceptional figure and not representative of his generation. Yet by examining a person at the margins because of his sexuality, his radical militancy against the dictatorship, and in defense of those with HIV AIDS later when he returned from exile, we can learn much about the complexities of Brazilian politics, society, and culture, the nature of the Brazilian left as it changed over time, and the constraints and options of those with non-normative sexuality who lived during the second half of the 20th century. So today I will briefly present a biography of Daniel, followed by a consideration of how his experiences in exile changed his thinking about politics in Brazil. 
Epiche Estacchio de Carvalho was a medical student at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. He joined an organization of the revolutionary left on March 28, 1967. Thirteen years later, he wrote, I will never forget that glorious day. But to make that decision, he had to sacrifice his sexuality, feeling compelled to repress his homosexuality in order to conform to the revolutionary codes and attitudes which considered sex between men a perversion or, at the very least, a petty bourgeois deviation. In, real, uh, in January 1969, to, due to his revolutionary activities, Herbert fled to Rio among, uh, with other members of the National Liberation Commandos, of which former President uh, Jim Hussefi was also a member. So context of a person within a larger context of people who have political uh, uh, importance over future decades. There he adopted the underground name Daniel, participated in the unification of several revolutionary organizations to form the Revolutionary Armed Forces Palmares, and then split with that group to refound the popular revolutionary vanguard, VPR. In 1970, he did rural guerrilla training with fo a former army captain, Carlos Lamarca, and 17 other guerrillas. When the army discovered the training area, he and 12 others escaped, returned to Rio, where Daniel participated in the kidnapping of the German ambassador, for the release of 40 political prisoners and later the sequester of the Swiss ambassador for the release of 70 others. Soon after, the organization to which he belonged collapsed and Daniel hid in a closed apartment in Niteroi, which is near Rio de Janeiro, for four months until one day two sympathizers, a couple, Claudio and Arisalva, offered to take care of this revolutionary refuge, refugee. Daniel remained underground for two more years, and during this time he and Claudio forged a close friendship. Claudio confessed that he was bisexual, while Daniel recounted to Claudio the anguish about his own homosexuality. On, on September 7, 1974, he and Claudio left the country with fake passports for seven years of exile. With the Carnation Revolution underway uh, in Portugal, they decided to live in that country. Claudio worked as a graphic designer for a revolutionary armed forces movement, and Daniel got a job in a women's magazine which sought to introduce feminist ideas into the Portuguese society in a traditional weekly. Daniel wrote articles on women's health, the international feminist movement, and reproductive rights, and during this period in Portuguese exile, influenced by socialist feminists, he began to rethink Marxism. And on a beach, uh, Claudio and Daniel uh, declared to each other desire to, to begin a relationship which lasted for 20 years. When the Portuguese Revolution took a turn to the right in November 75, the couple moved to Paris, where most of the Brazilian ex uh, exiles were concentrated. There were about 350 official exiles there, but a much larger community of Brazilians, which numbered maybe 1,000, who were politically engaged. Daniel got a job as, at a sauna, a gay sauna in the center of Paris's gay district, filled with bars and nightclubs. He also avoided internal fights of the Brazilian revolutionary groups. Quote, I refuse to survive in the smoke of closed and, uh, and solemnly useless meetings where everything is discussed and nothing decided. However, he made close re a friendship with women who were part of the Brazilian women's group and were uh, undergoing a process of reflection on the treatment of women on the left as they became feminist. For Daniel, the period in Portugal and in Paris allowed him to rethink politics, the errors of the armed struggle, and the left stands on homosexuality. Already in 1971, Daniel had concluded that the armed struggle was the wrong way to overthrow the dictatorship when he was underground. The isolation of underground groups, the lack of contact with others because of security issues, the economic expansion of since 1968 that neutralized the middle classes, and among other factors, um, these were among other factors leading to this strategy's defeat. Daniel uh, also questioned the left's inability to, re to understand sexual oppression as symptomatic of major problems of those fighting for the Brazilian Revolution. From 1969 to 1972, Daniel had lived isolated underground without any real contact with other people his group theoretically wanted to free. In exile, internal fights of leftist organizations kept them isolated. Quote, life abroad has not changed the main problems of leftist groups. On the contrary, it has sharpened dogmatism, crystallizing sectarianism. 
After denying his sexuality for many years, his new job in a gay sauna, which is basically a sex club, allowed him to affirm his erotic desires. But he entered gay life with an ambiguous feeling, quote, I escaped from a sect, it was not to fall into a ghetto, he commented in his memoirs. Daniel, for example, did not attempt to contact Marxists, Trotskyists, or Maoists that formed the Front Homosexuel d'Action Révolutionnaire with his anarcho-libertarian behavior and criticisms of orthodox leftists and the state. One FHAR manifesto, for example, stated, a club is in the realm of money. You dance with other men, you look at each other as a commodity, society exploits us there, fear persists, police invade. Rather, Daniel elaborated his own ideas about the gay world and its relationship to capitalism. Quote, the homosexual ghetto nowadays in developed countries is above all a set of commercial transactions, bars, cinemas, restaurants, offering all possibility, possible consumer attractions specializing for homosexuals. This criticism of the Marxist idea of false consciousness, which Daniel attributed to the ghetto's customers, quote, the fight against sexual oppression, the organization of homosexuals as a defined social group, is backed by the social forces interested in the full functioning of the ghetto. The ghetto cries out for freedom, a strange freedom, that of trying oneself to a, tying oneself to a particular market, that of becoming a cog in a society that apparently rejects the ghetto. So one day, a member of the cultural group of the Brazilian Amnesty Commission, which was fighting to uh, allow the Brazilian government to re uh, give the right for people to return to, to, to Brazil, they asked Daniel if he would participate in a public debate about homosexuality. However, there was resistance from many in the group that insisted that the theme had nothing to do with the group's goals of fighting for the amnesty of political prisoners. Quote, naively we thought, this is Daniel, na naively we thought that that medieval and open prejudice no longer existed at that time. Rarely does prejudice against homosexuality in general and sexuality in particular show itself within the left with such open aggression." End quote. The debate, Homosexuality and Politics, was held in May uh, 1979 in Casa do Brasil, which was uh, connected to the universities and it was financed by the Brazilian government for students, kind of a living and uh, cultural center. Gloria Ferreira recalls that the organizations prepared caipirinhas, which is a Brazilian drink, to serve when people arrived. They also played the song by Erasmus Carlos with the refrain, is everything I like illegal, immoral, or fattening? 200 people from the exile community attended the meeting. Members of the Brazilian Amnesty Commission cultural group sat up front, and Daniel presented his ideas. Ferreira recounts that he started the debate by asking the organizers why they were heterosexual. One member of the commission replied, I am black, poor, and leftist. If I were a homosexual, it would be a disaster. In an essay prepared for the event, Daniel argued that homosexuality is a category that was invented over the last two centuries and serves to reinforce normalcy by establishing a deviant other. And in fact, it's clear he's borrowing from Foucault without citing Foucault. He criticized the way one's sexuality became associated with one's entire being and attributed this process to capitalism. He wrote, in accepting the status of my minority that fights for its rights, what uh, one is doing in the form of protest and rebellion is linking capitalist discourse to the repression that one wants to fight. He also criticized the ghetto, quote, the interest of homosexuals is precisely not to be closed up in a group with common interests, in a kind of homosexual ghetto, as a homosexual social mi minority. For this reason, homosexuals should not build movements or organizations, but as homosexuals, as people, or better said, as political militants, individually fight against all attempts to build um, a homosexual ghetto. Although not explicitly stated, Daniel seemed set on not being marginalized as a homosexual. In the 1960s, he had repressed his sexuality to join the revolutionary movement. When he finally had the courage to confront the left's prejudices, he refused to consider that his sexuality represented his entire being. Rather than seeing the potential of the ghetto, or the gay and lesbian 
forms of sociability as cons uh, cons uh, constitutive forces that could engender a political movement to tear down the walls of prejudice that makes gay enclaves so attractive and desirable, he blamed the ghetto for producing and reproducing that prejudice. This early rejection of identity politics when a Brazilian movement barely existed and debates about homophobia in the left and society in general were in their incipient stages can be read as a desire to belong and feel included rather than isolated and set apart. But Daniel's thinking was at odds with Brazilian activists forging a new political movement simultaneously in Brazil, so they emerged as a Brazilian movement at this exact time in Brazil, which challenged homophobia and tried to reshape traditional stereotypes. If Daniel took advantage of exile to challenge the left's homophobia and develop a political critique of identity politics, when he returned to Brazil in 1981, he went through another transformation to embrace an identity as a gay man who was also a leftist. While exile allowed him to come out, accept his homosexuality, and elaborate new political theories that rejected an essentialized homosexual identity, ironically, returning to Brazil forced him to rethink once again ideas he had developed while abroad. In interviews about this first book, uh, uh, about his first book that criticized the left and the construction of rigid homosexual identity, Daniel rejected the emergent homosexual movement, as it was called at the time. Yet Daniel's thinking went through a dialectic process. Exile provided space free of repression and access to new ideas. Returning forced him to test those new ideas against political reality. Um, uh, the political reality of democratization and the emergence of new social movements. Living in Brazil again was, a transformative, was as transformative as a time of reassessment abroad. In 1982, Vieira, all, uh, uh, um, another former guerrilla, invited Daniel to join his electoral campaign for state legislature on the Workers' Party ticket. Daniel became a main collaborate, collaborator in the campaign. It was original and colorful, included uh, explicit defense of LGBT rights with the slogan, qualquer forma de amor vale a pena, any kind of love is worth it. Which is a reference to a song. And I'm almost finished. I'm, I'm totally on time. Uh, because the campaign also adopted a green platform, sectors of the traditional Marxist left called a Vieira, the Viado Verde, which means a gay faggot or a gay uh, homo. Uh, even though he wasn't gay, and dismissed the campaign. Nevertheless, Vieira and Lucia Arruda, uh, a feminist activist, were both elected to the state legislature on the Workers' Party slate. Times had changed. In 1985, a group of intellectuals and artists disillusioned with the single-minded emphasis um, of the Workers' Party in Rio on traditional Marxist ideas formed the Green Party. Daniel tried to run for state legislature on the <coughs> Green Party Workers' Party ticket targeting LGBT people as an electoral base. Building on the success um, of Vieta's victory, Daniel's campaign developed an innovative program moving away from Marxist formulations that focused exclusively on class conflict to values that stress freedom. The effort to forge links between specific problems of facing uh, problems facing gay men and lesbians, and other social questions was tantamount to achieving gay rights, in Danielle's opinion. Quote, we homosexuals have the, to be visible in political life. Acting as homosexuals, we are not only defending our rights, but also intervening in the society as a whole. We are radically demonstrating our choice in favor of freedom and our willingness to reorganize our daily lives so that we um, uh, engage in solidarity with others. A decade previously, Daniel argued that social change could only occur through the overthrow of capitalism and the establishment of a revolutionary government. Now these transformations were linked to individual actions, including empathy and support of others. He rejected unilateral notions of the homosexual. Instead, he used the term of a collective identity of people with a shared political agenda. Daniel's um, electoral material was lively and colorful. He, released, uh, he reused the 1982 slogan, uh, any form of, of love is worth it, and he coined an original phase, phrase, there is no democracy if it stops at the factory gate or at the edge of the bed. It encapsulates his attempts to integrate discussions about democracy, class politics, and sexuality. It suggests working class people also can have same-sex desires. Unfortunately, Daniel lost the race, and he moved on to work as a writer for, uh, from Rio's first AIDS foundation. Then in 1989, he found out he had AIDS. 
After overcoming the initial shock, he delved into a new political world with a campaign that transformed discourse, discourses about AIDS in Brazil. His ideas can be summed up in two notions. Quote, the cure for AIDS is solidarity and people with AIDS should not be condemned to a civil death. From our perspective today, the slogan, the cure for AIDS is solidarity, seems sensible, but it was actually, or banal, but it was actually revolutionary in the context when it was launched in 1989. Hibbert Daniel, a formal medical student, um, con conversant in the language of diseases, who had gained public no notoriety and an o as an openly gay author and one-time guerrilla leader, insisted that the cure for AIDS was supporting, was supporting others and not a medical procedure. It was a shocking statement. Danielle discussed compassion, support, and understanding rather than treatment protocols. Implicit was a call to be open and ab about one's HIV AIDS status and reach out to others who needed support. The slogan drew on concepts familiar to revolu the revolutionary left about solidarity with other people's struggles and challenged broad sectors of Brazilian society that had become politicized in the process of democratization. It was a call for inclusion and openness when few people declared that homosexuality in Brazil was a as declared their homosexuality in Brazil as a political act. It was a call for support and a discussion about the disease. The second phrase that he promoted, that AIDS should not mean one is condemned to a civic death, is a bit harder to understand for one not familiar with the context of Brazil's transition to democracy after two decades of authoritarian rule. The notion of citizenship, cidadania, as a status um, that all were entitled to and a condition that guaranteed equal rights to uh, all engaged uh, um, emerged as a concept uh, within the new social movements. A civic death meant losing those basic rights that the left had claimed were inherent to all. Succumbing to homophobia and prejudices about people with HIV AIDS, not having access to medical care or information about treatment meant having one's citizenship or one's essential rights nullified. Worse than death from AIDS, Daniel argued, was the denial of one's human or civil rights. Over the next two years, the language of solidarity and citizenship became hegemonic among AIDS activists. Daniel's approach to the disease won him an invitation as a keynote speaker at the International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam in July 1992 that was organized around the theme, A World United Against AIDS, and focused on human rights as a public health imperative. Sadly, Daniel died before he could deliver the paper, um, before he could deliver this message to a larger international audience. His life par partner, Claudio, delivered the talk on his behalf. Daniel drew on his vast experience in the revolutionary and later democratic left to propose an alternative way of discussing AIDS and how to tackle the disease. That approach helped uh, reshape AIDS discourse in Brazil and echoed beyond its borders. In 1972, a group of Brazilian exiles in Chile argued that they should use their exile as a political tool against the military regime. Exile changed Daniel, and then Daniel used his experience in exile and the application of those ideas modified when he returned to his homeland to change Brazil. Thank you.